This is Wealth Curve Talk with John L. Smallwood, certified financial planner and president of Smallwood Wealth Management. With more than 30 years of experience in helping people with wealth management, financial planning, business ownership, estate planning, insurance, and more, John's here to share the news you can use to improve your financial confidence. Now, best-selling author and six-time five-star wealth manager award winner, John L. Smallwood. Hello, this is John Smallwood. Hope everybody's doing really well today. We are back with Will O'Hara, who is the managing partner of New Jersey Life and Health. We're going to be talking about a very, very complex subject, which is called Medicare today. Welcome, Will. Thanks for having me, John. So, yes, thanks. As John mentioned, I am the founder and the managing partner of NJ Life and Health Insurance Group. We are a family-owned brokerage uh, out of Tom's River, New Jersey, specializing in Medicare. So we help people understand, sign up for, and analyze their Medicare coverage decisions, helping thousands of Medicare clients currently across 25 states. Which is pretty awesome. So we had an interesting way that we met each other. Um, as you, as most people know that I have dogs, and Will has a wonderful Newfoundland, Newfoundland poodle that's yes. a puppy that's, what is it, 10 months old? Uh, just reached nine months uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yes, he is a Newfoundland poodle. Some call him a Newfie poo, some call him a noodle. And he's a Newfie poo. He is funny and funny. It was like 10 <laughs> o'clock at night. Yes. We, we, the dogs had a really interesting interaction. Mm -hmm. it, Will was very open to letting my little puppy, Bo, get out of his aggressions. Correct. And Correct. then we ended up talking, oh, what do you do? And yeah. then we found out that our, our backgrounds and our stories collided with family business. Correct. And what you're doing to help people really navigate a space that is incredibly complex, right? Yes. It is yes. something that from our business perspective, why I have the licenses to discuss this and mm -hmm. to do this, this is not something that we do in any form or fashion for our clients because of the numerous issues and potholes and things that you really need to understand. But I wanted to step back for a second. Yeah. Be, before we started recording, we were having a conversation about how you end up where you are. And I think it's yeah. really interesting. Like, when you look at your background, you were with Credit Suisse. Correct. You correct. were working in Manhattan in investment banking. Yes. yes. And your father mm -hmm. had been in this business. For 30 some odd years. Similar to my father being yes. in the business. Yes. A little bit of a different path. Your father actually got sick, right? Yes. Yeah. So he, he got a little bit sick and, you know, working at an investment bank, it's not so easy to just take a week here and there. And sort of the time I was spending out of the office was, was becoming too difficult to, to sort of hold on to my responsibilities at this job. So I made the personal decision at that point, I believe that was October 31st of 2017, to up and leave to go back and ensure that the family was in a good place before I went back to a job. And you didn't place. have like a backstop. You didn't have like, you weren't you know, doing anything. Yeah. My backstop was, you know, when I left, you know, they give you access to your 401k. Sure. You can pay the tax on it, you know, the early fees. Um, but I actually had to use that 401k liquidate it to not only sort of just fund my, my monthly expenses, but, uh, in the long run, use that to create this new business. Um, you know, after we came back to take care of uh, our father, you know, ensure that, you know, he was doing everything he could to get back to his good health. Um, and he's here today and he's good. He's here today. Yeah, he's, he's great. Like, he works yeah. with the business. He's one of the family owners. Um, but at that point, uh, around the same time, my brother, who was working as a cancer researcher up in Maine at a, at a lab, had also decided that that wasn't the career path for him, basically working long hours for very little pay um, and working on grant funds. You know, in the science world, it can take a very, very long time to be well compensated for your knowledge base. And in the meantime, True. you're working like a dog for, for next to nothing. Um, so he uh, sort of concurrently upon me quitting my job, quit his job, um, and now we've got both of us at home with dad and we're like, what, what are we doing here? You know, yeah. take them to the appointments. Things are getting better. We've sort of done what we came back to do, but neither of us was really looking to go back to what we were doing. 
Right. Right? Like that was something. You know, once you leave working 120 hours a week at an investment bank on call 24 hours a day, it is very difficult to want to go back to that. Mm -hmm. Um, Sure, you know, the compensation is nice, but at the end of the day, you need that time with the family. Um, And after really digging into what dad had done over his lifetime, which was this business, he was an independent Medicare broker. It was sort of an epiphany moment where my brother and I, and I remember to this day, we're sitting in his bedroom talking shop about, you know, how are we going to make money? What are we going to do next? And, you know, even as kids, right? And John, I haven't told you this before, but at seven, eight years old, my brother and I, we go up to the beach, we find all the large seashells and we make our own candles, our own candles with all, you know, beach debris, making faces on candles and shapes and whatnot. Because you grew up in Long Beach. We grew up in Chippewa. Yeah, 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 and we yeah, would yeah. sell these seashells on the corner for five, 10 bucks a pop. Well, one summer we made over a thousand dollars, and this is sort of how we were brought up, you know, from a very young age. Entrepreneurial, correct, correct. You know, you want a new pair of board shorts to go surfing, you know, go buy them yourself at Ron John's because this isn't something that you know your parents are going to be able to constantly afford for you. So, having that instilled in us from a young age really helped us sort of navigate how we could go about making money again in the future, but doing something that made us happy. And what's interesting is the path, right? Yeah. I, I, I'm always interested in the path of how people get to where they were. You were very successful. You were in a high pressure job. Correct. Which if, and there was a, a realization that I need to step away. Yeah. Focus on family, focus Correct. on getting this person as mm-hmm. good as he can get to. But then the path opened up for you to come back into this because the phone yes. was ringing, right? The phone yes. was ringing. Yes, yes. People so, needed service. You know, over over you know thirty some odd years of being in the Medicare business, um, you know, my father amassed a sizable amount of clients, right? Mm-hmm. And not only were there these clients, but there was all of these clients' referrals, other folks that you know hadn't gotten help yet that still needed help. So while we were back, of course, you know, dad's phone is ringing off the hook as all of these folks still need help with Medicare. At that point, he initially, um, you know, tried to give us a little bit of training on sort of how he had done this. Um, and I'll be honest with you, it was training from 30 years ago, right? right. Things it was all changed. Old school yeah. Yeah. And so while, while it was very relevant, it was a good intro to the system. Upon trying to use this newfound training from 30 years ago, we realized that this just wasn't going to fly anymore. Yeah. You needed to know the complexities of how Medicare operates today, which is very, very different than 30 years ago. So let's just create the person who should be thinking about this, right? Yes. So at what age do I really need to start thinking about my Medicare decision? Like, well, when's too soon and when is too late? So you, you want to at least have an understanding of the expected costs on Medicare when you're planning for retirement. Oh, yeah. No, as we're doing as 30 or 40 years old. But in terms of the decision yeah. of taking Medicare, and if you do take Medicare, what ancillary or secondary policy to take, that must be known or at least begun, I would say, roughly a year ahead of time. Roughly a year ahead of time. Now, I wouldn't go any further because things can change and they can change drastically. This landscape has been changing dramatically. Correct. Correct. To give you an example, um, you guys may be aware that there was a Part D out-of-pocket max that was passed by the legislature last year that is actually going to roll out in 2025, whereby all of a sudden... Folks on Medicare will have a cap on what they could possibly spend on prescription drugs for the year. This is huge. So just, okay, so expand a little bit on that. So the cap is what the insurance company is going to pay? No. So What they're going to pay? The cap is the total out-of-pocket a Medicare beneficiary could pay in a given year. Okay. Total, Total. Total. Now, for the average person on Medicare who takes a couple of generic medications... This doesn't really help because you're spending so much less than that currently. Okay. But for the folks that are on a number of name brand medications, this is big. I have seen clients spend over $10,000 a year on prescription medications for a single person. To have a limit of $2,500 per Medicare beneficiary is a very, very big change. And so... What was the limit? There was no limit. Medicare is a federal program, which means there is no out-of-pocket maximum. 
If your total costs exceed $100,000, your total costs exceed $100,000. This is not a private insurance plan with an out-of-pocket max that most people are familiar with. Okay. This is the same on original Medicare parts A and B, as well as part D of Medicare, which is the drug coverage. This advent of having an out-of-pocket on the drug coverage is a very big change. That's Very a really change. big change. So let's just step back. Let's yes. step like back to the basics. So, so I'm yeah. 64 years old. I'm getting ready to turn 65. Yeah. So what you're going to see at 64 is everybody knows that you're about to turn 65. This so your mailbox is going to fill up. Your mailbox is going to fill up. The ads on TV all of a sudden yes. are getting targeted yes. to it's, you. It's no coincidence that all the ads you see start to become geared towards Medicare, whether that's you on Facebook, the internet, your TV, you know, scrolling through your cell phone, your mailbox, everything. Celebrities all Medicare over. Based. Celebrities all over TV. Yeah. And, and seeing all of this marketing, one would realize that Medicare is a, a complicated web. Yeah. A web of election periods, um, enrollment time frames, the premiums you must pay, the secondary plans to choose from, IRMA in some cases, which is the income-related monthly yeah. adjustments some folks must pay, and the coverage of prescription drugs, which, as you know, previously mentioned, is an ever-changing beast. So when you see all of this information, it can be sort of a, an analysis paralysis where you don't quite really understand the very basics. And, and the reason that is is because the companies don't send you the very basics. Now they're, right? they're they're always focusing on cost and or things that are really not the important thing. So Correct. Let's dig into what is it that I would need to consider. Yeah, and, and walking I, into this first stage. I think it would be very beneficial to just do just a quick two minute history so that you know we understand the, the, the terminology that I'm about to use and understand why the market looks the way it does now. This is very important so that we can understand why these plan options exist and how they're operating within the system. Yeah. So quick history, Medicare came about in 1965. And at that time, it came in two parts, part A and part B, and it is held as those two parts sits. Right. This is original Medicare. It has always been the same A and B. Everything's, I, everything's a foundation. I'll correct, think. correct. Part A of Medicare was meant to cover inpatient hospital, and part B of Medicare was meant to cover your medical costs, also known as outpatient, outside of the hospital. So between these two parts of Medicare, you had hospital coverage and you had doctor and outpatient coverage. Now, everything held the same till about 2003. Okay. In 2003, the federal government allowed for the introduction of what is called Medicare Advantage, which was a privatized alternative to the federal system made available to any Medicare beneficiary. Now, this system is the basis for most of the confusion people see as they age into this Medicare program or begin to think about that decision of right. what to do. So real quick, why Medicare Advantage was brought into the fold? Well, you have to understand that original Medicare is a very generous program. Yes. It is a contractual agreement between the United States government and someone over the age of 65, or in some cases with disability that has been granted Medicare, right. to cover all needed and necessary services. And what this amounts to is a system whereby if your doctor recommends you need something, it's yours. No prior authorization for covered services. Okay, that's and Medicare Part. This is Medicare Parts A and B. Both, okay. They're leaving the responsibility of what you should be doing procedurally and health-wise with your doctor, which is what everyone would want. Correct. You go to your doctor, your doctor makes a recommendation, and then you would expect that you can follow through on that recommendation. Surgery, testing. Surgery, chemotherapy, and you know those sorts of situations, dialysis, radiation, major surgery, knee replacements, physical therapy, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Medicare ensures that whatever you may need by way of a doctor saying it's medically necessary is yours. And so, in essence, anything a doctor may request you do must be covered by Medicare. Well, a program that generous is difficult to keep solvent. Right. Yeah. Which is an issue. It is. It is. And I'm sure everybody's heard over the past few decades the conversations that have been had. You know, the Medicare trust fund is going to be bankrupt by this date. Oh, no, now it's this date. 
Well, back in the early 2000s, we have to know that the advent of Medicare Advantage saved the government that future risk of payout. Because as an alternative to federal Medicare, the way a Medicare Advantage plan operates is on a stipend, a set dollar amount, from the federal Medicare system. Not to exceed. Not to exceed, and let's just use round numbers here. Yeah. We'll call it $13,000. Okay. So if you join a Medicare Advantage program, you lose the original federal system of A and B, the no prior authorization. Once and forever? Well, we'll talk about that in a okay. moment. But right. if you choose an Advantage, you are removed from that system, or, you know, the federal Medicare system, and you go in to this privatized system whereby they have a stipend to cover you for the year. Now, Medicare, they want you in these programs. Now, they'll never say this, but right. why, why wouldn't they want you in this program? Because they know what they're going to spend on you this year, right? right? Now, they're, you're off their books. You're off their books. That is exactly right. The risk is now on the Advantage Company. Now, that Advantage Company gets $13,000 to cover you. And if you're- From enrolled, Medicare. From Medicare. So, Medicare is limiting- Correct. They know they're paying thirteen thousand. Correct. They're reinsuring it. Now there are there's a little more to it. You know, yeah. companies can request a little more payment for you know chronic conditions and things like that. But for the most part, most beneficiaries are stipended the same amount to the Advantage Company, where it's up to them to allocate that money in a way that gives you coverage, quote unquote, equivalent to Medicare. Gives you extras. These are the sort of window dressings you see on TV. But at the end of the day, these companies are in the business to do what? Make money, right? right it's right. to make the profit. And in the Advantage world, the profit is the remainder of stipends not spent. 13,000 minus expenses. Correct. 13 grand minus expenses. So motives wise, you're 66 years old and you need a knee replacement. If you go to your Advantage carrier and they know that they're about to pay out $30,000 on this knee replacement, do you see now why they might initially deny that, suggest you go through maybe six months of physical therapy and ultrasound and an MRI before they even consider covering that? Right. It's because they want to spread that cost over more years because in one year alone, 30 grand off of 13000 is a big loss. And what causes somebody to... So here we are, we're 65, we're making a decision either mm -hmm. go to Medicare Advantage or go Versus to Medicare. Medicare. So like, original. what's that, why would somebody, like what's that decision point there? Yeah, so this, this decision of, do I keep my original Medicare and supplement it, or do I trade it in for the privatized alternative, Medicare Advantage, is the major decision. This yeah. is the fork in the road. Right, because now, Medicare Part A has a cost. Well, right. well, wait, Medicare Part A does not have a so Medicare right. Part A is the premium free part of Medicare if you've worked in this country for 10 years or have your 40 credit hours. Right. Part B, however, does have a cost. That baseline cost is $164.90 a month. Deducted from your Social Security. Deducted from your Social Security if you're taking it or billed to you quarterly if you haven't it. taken it yet. Right. Now, this Part B premium, what everyone needs to know is this is your sunk cost. It doesn't matter whether you keep the original or trade it in for Advantage you will always pay your Part B premium. So even when you leave the system, you're still spending that Part B premium and Medicare is just you know, continuing to subsidize or stipend that right. Medicare Advantage number. And that premium can go up based upon income. Well, yes. That initial premium, that baseline premium of Part B of Medicare is based on your income. Yeah. And the numbers are as follows. If you are a single person with an adjusted gross income less than 97,000, you pay the baseline premium. If you're a married couple with an adjusted gross income less than 194,000, you pay the baseline premium. Okay. But here's where it gets quirky. Medicare, or in this case, Social Security for Medicare's premium, Social Security is pulling your tax return transcript from two years prior. Correct. So there's a lag in the system. Right. Where this year, 2023, they're using everybody's 2021 income. And they are just pulling the adjusted gross income or modified adjusted gross income line item directly from the 1040, that's what they use. Okay. Now, let's say you're over these limits. Well, that baseline rate does go up, and it goes up in a bucketed or bracketed fashion right. where there are different levels or steps up 
where the max Part B premium, I believe, is around five hundred and sixty dollars a month. When you hit that upper level, when you hit that upper level, the highest level, so the most you could end up paying for just original Part B is about five hundred and sixty dollars a month per person. person. Per person, a couple in those high income brackets, you're looking at eleven, twelve hundred dollars a month just for original Medicare. Interesting. That's where the problem uh, arises because original Medicare, if you do stay that route and sort of capitalize on the good things about original Medicare, no prior authorizations, 99% of non-pediatric physicians take it, it's a nationwide network. In order to capitalize on these benefits of Medicare, you need to have someone covering the out-of-pocket risks. Right. Because although Medicare is very generous, again, unlike any private insurance, there is no out-of-pocket max. And although your original Medicare gets you access to the system that is Medicare, it comes with, as you use risk, it, risk. deductibles, co-pays, co-insurance, Part B excess, so on and so forth. Denial of claims. Well, no, no not at all. If you sure. stick with original Medicare, denial of claims is not an issue. Oh, right. It's not an issue. Right. But the issue is the out-of-pocket cost of using the system. So the idea is when you stick with the original program, which is what we always recommend because you want that access to services, right. you must have a Medicare supplement agreeing to cover your out-of-pocket risks. Because for one example, on Medicare, you owe 20% of all Part B services. Well, let's say, God forbid, you deal with something like dialysis, chemotherapy, radiation, where 20% happens to be tens of thousands of dollars. Right. So you're spending... There's no limit on Medicare. You're spending a couple hundred thousand in a year on some of those... It's yeah. possible. It's possible. I have seen claims into the millions on yes. Medicare. So you're responsible for 20%. You're, you're responsible for 20%. Now, now the good news is, um, you know, Medicare pays doctors well, mm. but they do not pay an exorbitant amount, which means your 20% is not exorbitant, but it is still 20% of a large figure. So, for example, you know, folks may see bills, right? A long hospital stay, you could look at a bill and say, Oh my goodness, they bill my insurance company a million dollars. Yeah. And then you see underneath it, insurance adjustment. What does that mean? 149000 Correct, correct. <laughs> the insurance adjustment is the insurance company readjusting what was billed to the contractually allowed rate for that service. Mm -hmm. So for example, on Medicare, if a doctor takes Medicare, he accepts what's called Medicare assignment. He accepts what Medicare is willing to pay. So even though the hospital billed a million dollars, let's say because they accept Medicare, they have accepted 50 grand. Well, Medicare is going to write that million dollars down, $950,000 down to 50 grand, and you pay 20% of that. Now, that is a, you know, an extrapolated example. Sure, sure. Um, but there are claims where the 20% can be 20% of hundreds of thousands of dollars, something like an extended dialysis and chemotherapy or radiation. Even some back surgeries have exceeded $100,000 in payment. 20% would be that $20,000. Mm. This also doesn't account for the fact that there are some doctors in this country that charge a little bit more under the Medicare system. These doctors are called Part B excess providers, and Medicare allows these folks to charge this extra 15%, leaving you out of pocket a considerable amount more if this doctor happens to be the one who performed the surgery. 15%. Correct. So the idea is you don't want to take on these risks yourself because there's an infinite financial risk. There is no out-of-pocket max. So depending on how high your claims go, the responsibility could continue to go higher on your rent. So I go into the Medicare Advantage side. Okay, and opposite. Yeah. Opposite side, like yep. what happens in that same scenario? So in that same scenario, if you chose Medicare Advantage, you do remove yourself from the A and B of Medicare's network and sort of system. Okay. Where remember, Advantage is an alternative. Right. When you join an advantage, you lose that original Medicare access. Remember what I mentioned earlier. Original Medicare is accepted at 99% of non-pediatric providers. John, do you know of any other insurance company that you go to 99%? No. It doesn't exist like that. It does not exist. No. When you jump into a Medicare advantage, you do leave that on the table. Because you've said, I would not like to be part of that program. I'd like to be part of a privatized version. Now, this privatized version will have its own network its own set of benefits, its own set of doctors, its own set of authorizations, requirements, step therapies, et cetera. And it's basically a play by their rules, okay? okay? Whereby, unlike original Medicare, 
and a Medicare supplement where you may pay extra for another company to cover your out-of-pocket responsibilities, this is sort of an all-in-one plan where you don't pay anything extra per month. That's just your base. Correct. Whatever that that means. part be base that everyone pays. So you move over to Advantage, and most of these plans come with zero premium. Right. Most of them also come with extras that they know original Medicare doesn't cover. This is where a lot of people get caught up. And they're like, oh wow, I'm getting yeah. all this extra stuff that Medicare right, doesn't correct. cover. Did, did you get your vision, your dental, your rise to the doctor, your hearing aid benefit, your grocery card benefit, your pharmacy over the counter benefit? It's all about the added benefits. Because remember, this private advantage company is not original Medicare. So although original Medicare doesn't cover these things, the advantage company can, they just have to deduct those, deduct those coverage costs from the $13,000 stipend they gave you, mm. right? So okay. what they do is they use a portion of this money to give you the extras. And the extras increase every single year. This is what we call the window dressing. Yes. Because extras are great, but what's happening behind the scenes that allows this to function that way? Yeah. Yes, you do get the extras, but everything comes at a cost. And this is the big misconception. You see all the advertisements, everything's zero dollars or free or whatever term they want to use, everything is zero. Well, in actuality, nothing is zero. Okay. Sure, the plan premium may be zero, but you're paying as you go within this private Medicare Advantage system, whereby you have a copay. Copay at the primary doctor, copay at the specialist, 50 bucks for an x-ray, 300 for a CT scan, 900 for a PET scan, $300 a night at the hospital, and so on and so forth. So you're subject to all those expenses. You're subject on an a la carte basis to the services you use within this system. Now, a couple of things there. One. All services are now up to a private company, meaning somebody else is somebody else is making decisions has the responsibility it. to determine whether or not your claim is medically necessary. And it sounds like that out of pocket could actually be substantially higher than the than the out of pocket on traditional. It's very very possible, and here's why. Although the plan is zero dollars, they do put an out of pocket max on the private version of Medicare because it's a private insurance plan. So out of pocket max comes back. Right now, the average out-of-pocket backs, and it does differ by state, in New Jersey, we'll call it 7,500 bucks. For the year, your out-of-pocket max is 7,500 bucks. So worst case scenario, you spend 7,500 bucks. Even worst case scenario, you have a chronic illness that requires constant treatment, and you're spending that $7,500 every year. Now that doesn't account for the one big out-of-pocket that could arise if you have problems with the coverage itself. Now, I mentioned to you before, yeah. when you have an Advantage plan, these claims are no longer between you, your doctor, and Medicare. Your claims are between you, your doctor, and this Advantage company, which holds the cards on whether they will approve it. Well, if you're a 67-year-old man and you would like to get a knee replacement and you're running into some issues with the Advantage company where they're basically saying, we're not going to cover it this year, we want you to run through some hoops, if you have the means, you may just pay for this knee replacement. You may just pay the 20 or 30 grand out of pocket because you can't get coverage for it on your plan. We see this all the time in North Jersey. Where if it was Medicare. Where, and that's exactly what you're pointing out. Flop it. Let's say the same 67 year old man had original Medicare. You know, when he gets his knee replacement, next available appointment, as soon as next day. That difference in access to coverage is huge. Yeah. And most people do not give it enough value that having access to the things you need is worth everything. It's worth everything, right? And it doesn't sound like I saved a lot of money. No. And, and so, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, well, on the advantage side, I saved the monthly premium. Well, sure you do, but now you're playing a pay as you go game where your future costs are unknown. Will I pay the out of pocket max this year? Will I have an uncovered service I have to pay out of pocket and take it a step further? Am I going to deal with something where I may want to see a specialist in Texas because he's the top of his field, but my Advantage company doesn't let me leave the state? Yeah. And what if I'm on vacation? Well, that's a very good question, right? So <laughs> I, will, I will say just flat off the bat, the only, well, not the only, but the largest nationwide network is Original Medicare. No matter where you are in the 50 states or territories, you have coverage under Medicare. Right. With Medicare Advantage, what normally happens is that these are regionalized plans. 
where the vast majority of the network will be within your state and in some cases within your county, mm -hmm. okay? Now, most of these plans over the last couple of years have realized the detriment that Medicare beneficiaries face when they can't leave their state. And so they are adding a bit of nationwide coverage on these zero dollar advantage plans, but normally by way of using their HMO nationwide network, which is still a very small subset of the total doctors taking Medicare, yeah, right? Yeah. So while you may have a little bit of nationwide coverage, either A, it's very few doctors, or B, it is only for emergencies. Right, so now I'm sitting here, I'm facing down this decision. We've painted a really interesting picture that the Medicare Advantage program, while being free, opens you up to to additional expenses. Well, I, it opens you up to unpredictable costs. Correct. And unaccessible services. Correct. So therefore, you're you're in a box and you can't get the services that you may want. Correct. Now, pause, pause right there, right? Because yeah. most people would say, well, I'll just change my plan. Things aren't working out. We'll make a change. This is what we have to focus on for just a minute here. Good. State by state, this can be very different. And I want to focus on New Jersey just first because it's probably the vast majority of people who will be listening. Sure. In the state of New Jersey, when you either A, turn 65, or B, first take your Part B of Medicare if you've delayed it, this kicks off what is known as your initial election period. In mm -hmm. the state of New Jersey, uh, regulates that all Medicare supplement carriers in this state must offer you coverage, no questions asked, during this first six months. Now, what do I mean by no questions asked? No I pre, mean no, no pre-existing conditions, conditions, no health questions. Now, a lot of people think back and they say, well, I thought Obama solved that. He did, for individual insurance. Correct. None of this applied to Medicare. None of it. None of it. None of it. Medicare supplement companies can be as choosy as they wish after that initial six months. So to your uh, question earlier, and, and let's talk about what if you're in a bind later in life, you're in an advantage plan, you're having some issue with coverage or costs, and you say, let me just hop back over to this great original Medicare. Well, while you may be able to jump over to the original Medicare system, what you may not be eligible for is that Medicare supplement that pays your out-of-pocket costs. Because at this point, being six months past your initial effective date, they will subject you to health underwriting. So pre-existing conditions will limit Pre-existing conditions will limit what you can do, if not limit your move at all. All right. So I will say that this underwriting So, so effectively stuck. Because the underwriting stuck. Because the underwriting is going to be pretty Pretty intense. difficult. Now, now, I don't want people to take this the wrong way because you always have the right each year to say, I want to go back to original Medicare. You can do that, but you're running along with an infinite financial risk and no out-of-pocket max unless you have a Medicare supplement. So going that route without it basically means you're self-funding your insurance. And do people make a decision, like, I'm sure this happens out there, where yeah. they're like, I'm going to go back. Yes. They leave, but then they realize that they don't realize that they're off the Medicare Advantage that they can't get the supplement until, <laughs> until it's too late. Yes, uh, we see so many different versions of that story. Whether it's someone who didn't realize that they enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan because somebody called on the phone, asked if they were getting extra benefits. Before they knew it, they offered their Medicare number and at the end of the day, they ended up switching their plan without knowing that's one way that people fall victim to this. So if you hear extra benefits, you need to be aware. You need, you need to be careful. And, okay. and I'll say this for everyone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the Medicare world, New Jersey has some of the highest commissions on Medicare Advantage plans. And what that so leads the free, to... So the free program. Correct, correct. These free leading programs, people to... Uh -huh. That's why all the ads are on well, TV? Well, not just, just the ads, but the call centers, right? So every major Medicare call center in this country is dialing in New Jersey. Yeah, because New Jersey has the highest commissions on these products. So the marketing here is more robust than probably any other state in the country. And there's more people here. And there's a lot more people. And even on a monthly basis, we have on average in New Jersey between seven and 10,000 people a month turning sure, 65 uh, in this state alone. So unlimited prospecting. Unlimited prospects, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the vast majority of these people jump into this decision with very little background, very little diligence, make an initial decision, 
and then think, ah, you know, if, if I didn't do this right, I'll get help in the future. And that idea right there, I'm going to do it myself first, and if it's a problem, I'll fix it later, is the biggest mistake you could make. Because in the future, there may not be a fixing it. Right. So I, I'm just going to paint a bad picture for a second. I yep. make this decision. I don't have a supplement because I can't qualify for the supplement. Correct. That same example of the million dollars spent in the hospital and the 50000 Yes. What vulnerabilities now have I exposed myself to? Well, infinite. Infinite. Because again, we come back to anybody's claims could reach any level. It depends what level of you know so, sickness or calamity you face, right? Claims could be 100 grand. Claims could be $5 million. And it all depends on exactly what they're doing. My father right? spent 90 days in an ICU facility. There you go. And it was... First month was 1.5. So let's, let's the first month yes, was yes, 1.5. Yes. All right, perfect example. Yeah, you yeah. spend 90 days in the, in the ICU. So Medicare does you the favor for the first 60 days. Correct. The first 60 days are covered at a flat deductible amount. And I believe right now it's around 1,600 bucks. Now, if you're in the hospital for less than 60 days, you did well. Yeah. You come out, all you owe is $1,600 no matter what they it's did. It's what you want. Yes. Yes. So you yes. want to get the hell out of the correct. hospital. Yeah. Now, now, downside, if you're there for only one night, it is the same $1,600 deductible. And every 60 days, it resets. Now, to your question, what if you're there for more than 60 days, right? Yeah. As an extended time in the hospital progresses, the cost you must pay to Medicare increases the longer you stay. Mm -hmm. Whereby, once that 60 days passes, you're paying daily co-pays to be in the hospital. And that daily co-pay after day 60 is roughly $400 for the next 30 days. And if you by chance go over per, per, day, day, per day, per day, and if you by chance go over 90 days, 800 bucks a day, a day, that is your risk of being on original Medicare without a supplement at the hospital, at the hospital. Right. Now, what about Part B services? That's where the 20% comes in. Correct. Where something like dialysis, which is done in an outpatient facility or chemotherapy or surgery, outpatient facilities are billed under Part B where you owe 20%. Now, nobody should ever be concerned about owing 20% on a doctor's visit. No. Right? This is a consultation, low value, low 20%. But that surgery or those major scans, tests, services, what have you, will result in thousands of dollars, if not tens of thousands of dollars, depending on what you're doing. Yeah. So I'm in this thing, I'm there 65 days, mm -hmm. and now I'm paying this copay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no there's no insurance on that if I don't have the Medicare supplement. Correct. What if I'm on an advantage? Well, if you're on an advantage and you end up in the hospital, a couple things will happen. One, you'll likely need prior authorization to be an inpatient in that hospital bed. This is a pretty big difference from Medicare. On an emergency visit. Uh-huh. So <laughs> what, we got, what we have to remember is that the emergency room is outpatient. Correct. Once they admit you, you're, you're inpatient. inpatient. All right. So there's you a very a, big difference but between you, the two. But you need authorization to be input. Correct. Correct. So as you're cycling between the emergency room into inpatient, that is where the hospital is getting the prior authorization from your plan to give you that hospital bed. Now, once you get that hospital bed... What are you looking at paying? Well, it's usually $300 to $400 a night for the first five nights. Comes out to about $1,600. No coincidence that that's the Part A deductible on original Medicare. But what happens after, right? Yeah, yeah. So on, and it's a very interesting question, right? On Medicare Advantage, your daily costs end at day five, right? So you only pay, let's say it was $350 a night on day five, that's it. You pay $350 a day for five days, but let's say you're still in the hospital for 60 days. Yeah. Okay. That 60 day stay must be time and time again approved by the Advantage Company for you to be staying there. And as soon as they deem it no longer medically necessary that you be in that hospital, you're out. Mm -hmm. So when you hear people talk about the problems of health maintenance organizations kicking people out of hospitals and rehabs and other acute care facilities, this is what they're talking about. Because they don't want to pay. Because they don't want to pay. Because at that point, you're not paying anything. So the Advantage Company is looking at it saying, well, how much longer can we pay for it before this becomes a financial risk to us or before we don't think this is making any more sort of medical improvements? This is a very, very common issue. Now, just backing up for a yep. second, I 
take the traditional and I get a Medicare supplement. And I know there's a lot of options with the yes. Medicare supplement, which we'll talk about, but that same five days, six days will cost you zero dollars and zero cents. Because of the supplement. Because both of the most common Medicare supplements in the country, which we'll talk about, Plan G and Plan N are currently the most common. They both cover hospital charges in full. As an inpatient in the hospital, you owe zero dollars, no matter how long you are there, no matter what they do. Right. And that is basically whatever Medicare is not covering. Correct. They are covering. Whatever you would otherwise be billed on original Medicare, the supplement is paying. For. That 20%. Correct. Correct. Okay. So let's talk about, I just want to step back for a second. Sure. So I just want to recycle through this for a second. So I'm 64. I am going to, I work for a company. I'm not retiring. Uh, yes. I'm now getting billed for Medicare. Well, quarterly. You shouldn't be billed for Medicare quarterly. If you are still working over the age of 65 and you have insurance based on current employment. Okay. So we're sort of beelining in a different direction here, but this is very important. Because these are questions that people get. Yes. As you're nearing that age of being eligible for Medicare, before we jump into, you know, what's my decision on Medicare? Well, what's my decision about taking Medicare initially? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because a lot of people, especially now versus, you know, a decade ago, are continuing to work past the age of 65. Right. They're not taking their Social Security benefits until their full retirement age, or in some cases, not until 72. Right. And so you have this picture where everyone's becoming eligible. Some people are thinking they need to do something. And the other folks are sort of seeing that you're not required to take Medicare if you are still working or your spouse is still working and you have insurance coverage based on that current employment. This idea of having insurance coverage based on employment yes. is very important. So for instance, if you are retired or have some great you know, union plan, retirement plan, pension plan that's paying for your health benefits, et cetera, and you haven't taken Medicare, you can't rely on that plan forever because when you do eventually need to take Medicare, you will actually be fined or penalized for not having taken it when first available. Interesting. Yeah. Say so, again. Say yeah, again. yeah. So we're going to back again. up. We're going to yeah. back up. Yeah. All right. All right. And this is a, a very common uh, misunderstanding in the Medicare system of, do I need to take my Part B? So let me lay it out as flat as possible. Yeah. You are required to take Part B when first eligible. Otherwise, they will fine you 10% of the going premium per month for the rest of your life. Period. End Period. Story. End of story. For every year you didn't have it. So if you miss it for 10 years, that's 100%. Double your Part B premium for life. For life. Even a one-year lag on your Medicare, and the current premium is 164 so $16 a month. You're looking at $10,000 over 25 years for a one-year mistake. $10,000. So Even if I have coverage from my employer. Well, no, 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 no. I'm saying if you've run afoul of what Medicare requires, which is signing up when first eligible, unless... You have coverage based on current employment. Or spouse has. Or the spouse has on current employment. But what's not allowed, right, is coverage based on previous employment, like a retirement plan, a union plan, et cetera. And this is a new sticking point that a lot of people don't understand. Coverage based on current employment from an employer who employs less than 20 full-time equivalent employees. This is a big one. If you work for a small family company, right? We've got lots of them. Minus one, worst maybe one, you know, somewhere where there aren't more than 20 W-2 employees. If that's the case, these companies and their insurance plans can never be primary to Medicare. Correct. Meaning, if you're in one of these plans and assume, oh, I'm still working, I don't need to take Medicare, but your employer employs less than 20, oh no, you need to take Medicare because if you don't, your current insurance through that employer cannot process the claim because it hasn't first been billed to Medicare. So what ends up happening is you become the payer of Medicare's claims until you eventually realize you needed to sign up. And now you're stuck with the penalty. Now you're stuck with the penalty. You've been paying all your claims in the meantime, and your employer is paying over $1,000 a month for a 65-plus-year-old person that they shouldn't be paying for. But a lot of people are you know, just misunderstanding what you need to do around these time frames and how this is going to work. Yeah. It's not like they're in their face telling you, hey, less than 20 employees, we're not going to pay your claims. It's buried in the details. It's buried in the details. So, so lots of 
penalty traps there. Lots of penalty traps. And, and another one that's not necessarily a penalty trap, but you know, potentially just a poor financial choice is comparing your current coverage to Medicare. I can't tell you how many people are going to retire. They call me up, you know, just to confirm that they don't need to take Medicare while they, you know, have insurance at this moment. They forget to ask, well, how much does Medicare cost? And how does that relate to what I'm paying right now for my insurance? Which is a big difference. Some people have no idea that they're, you know, they're getting $2,000 a month withdrawn from their W-2 paycheck to carry them, their wife, and their two kids. Correct. Right? You ask the question, how much are you paying per month? Most people don't know. Oh, so many details. Right? So many details. And that's part of, like, our whole process and the blueprinting process is to get that minutia down. Because if you don't know what you have, yeah. how do you know what you should decide? Correct, correct. So this is analysis I do countless times a day for so many clients, right? Should I take Medicare now? And it's based off of, because they have the option, they're still working and they have coverage of taking it or leaving it. So at that point, you need to compare it to what you've got, where a lot of people say, well, I only pay 200 bucks a month and I know Medicare is probably gonna be more than that all day and I'm good. But take it a step further. Oh, well, I've actually been dealing with cancer. I've got an $8,000, you know, deductible and a $15,000 out-of-pocket max, and I've hit this out-of-pocket max two of the last three years. Okay, well, that $200 premium doesn't mean much when you're spending $15,000 a year out-of-pocket. Right. Medicare is actually a far cheaper alternative, and in actuality, you won't need the prior authorizations you've been dealing with for all these treatments. Right. And so it is oftentimes a good option, even if you do have that option of coverage from your current employment. Interesting. Yeah. So, okay, so that applies to a lot. Of, a lot it does. Of it does. And the family business thing is a big one, too. You know, oh, that 20 less. When you got, you know, sometimes I've seen and this. And it's before. not just the family employees. No, it's, no. You've got a 65 year old person who works in a family business. With yes. Or is employees. one of the owners, right? And, yeah. you know, yeah. they've, they've bought the best plan for their employees, right? They love their plan. Everybody's well taken care of. And they think when they turn 65, well, I want to keep this plan. I pay for the best, and it's for me, too. Let me keep it. It, not realizing that, you know, when they start making claims, Medicare is not going to pay their share because you don't have Medicare. Yeah. Now, where people really fall victim is when they're relatively healthy and don't realize for years because they're not using the services, right? right? And all of a sudden, you're three years down the road going for your first doctor's visit in three years. Nobody's paying for it. And you realize you missed your Medicare effective date by three years. You have a three-year penalty and... You think you're going to get the premium back from that company you just paid for three years that wasn't covering you primarily? No, you're not. No. You're not. So these are huge pitfalls that you know don't happen often, but can happen with missing information. So really, I mean, we always think about it in the financial planning process as there's going to be you know the Part B expense, there's going to be a Medicare supplement expense, and then there's going to be certain out-of-pocket expenses that are always yes. out there, right? Yes. And when you see the stats that are out there, people will say, well, medical costs, and they're thinking it's long-term care costs are going to be, you yeah. know, on average, a lot of money, but yeah. medical costs... Medical costs without long-term care are, are awesome. hundreds of thousands of dollars right. in a long-term retirement plan. Do you have those stats? I do. I do. Okay. All right. So, and you know, some folks may find this scary because again, a lot of people don't plan for this. Okay. So here are the numbers. Let's imagine today that you pay the baseline Part B rate. I mean, you're paying the lowest amount. You live Correct. under those thresholds Correct. and you have a Medicare supplement and you have a drug plan. We didn't go over this yet, but we're gonna imagine for a moment that you spend an average of $20 a month on your medications, okay. which is sort of lower end, yes. but these are the numbers I'm gonna use. Part B, a plan G, and a standard drug plan over the next 25 years, so from 65 all the way up to 90. That will cost a couple roughly $300,000 over 25 years, and that only accounts for premiums. No out of pocket. No out of pocket. Now granted, with a plan G, your out-of-pocket on A and B is limited to the Part B deductible, which is currently about $226. Yep. Not a big deal. But what's missing from that is the moving target of prescription drugs. Now, I mentioned to you that there is this out-of-pocket max coming in 2025, which will limit people. But if you happen to be facing a number close to that out-of-pocket max over these 25 years, or more likely, you're subject to an IRMA penalty. Yeah, if you write it. That, that, yes. what, what is IRMA? Okay. So again, we, we talked about the um, sort of 
baseline income you must fall below to pay the standard rate. Yeah. But what Medicare says is if you make above this, we need you to pay an income-related monthly adjustment amount. That's what IRMA stands for. Yes. Where basically you make more, you pay a little bit more into the system. Okay. The good news is you're successful. The bad news is you've got higher Correct. Expenses. So Correct. you're actually being means tested there. Well, a little bit. A yeah, little bit. Now, yeah. now, you know, that same figure I gave you before, let's imagine that you're at the top of the Irma spectrum. That $300,000 over a lifetime gets closer to $700,000 for a couple. So $700,000 of expense over 25 or 30? Over 25 years. Over 25 years. Of known expenses, and that's assuming a 3% inflation rate. So that's a significant amount of capital in a retirement plan that's significant. that is significant. I guess not only is it significant, it's far more than what people expected. Far more. Far more. And that's why it's so important to have these conversations so early on. And then you capitalize that, or I don't mean capitalize, but yeah. you compound that problem uh -huh. with end of life strategies, which Medicare- That doesn't only... include the long-term care piece, which if self-funded and you happen to live 10 years in long-term care, that's another million dollars. Right. So basically the wealth that we've created is slowly, systematically being deteriorated during this retirement. During the distribution phase, and not, having, and not having good protection yes. is actually accelerating the possibility of those expenses to be higher. That same couple exactly. spending 300,000 not having the proper coverage could be substantially more. Correct, correct. Well, not only could it be substantially more, but I can't stop bringing us back to access to services. Correct. Right? Because it's the money is one thing, but it's not having access to something you need that may lead you to spending money outside the system. People that I work with, my, yeah. my clients, they want to go to their doctors. Correct. They want to go correct. to the... Hey, they have an issue. I want to find the best potential outcome for what I have. Yes, I'm going yes. to go here, yes. regardless of where it is. And if they choose the wrong plan, mm -hmm. exactly they can't. Right, right? They can't go. So, so or they got to write a check. Yes, yes. So, and, and you find that sometimes. Now, that is why Medicare has all these out-of-pocket costs, right? Because they want to keep as many of these great doctors within the system as they possibly can. So. They let some of these top tier doctors charge more, like I mentioned earlier, and you have the ability to see all these types of folks with the original program. But if you happen to have chosen the wrong plan initially, well, only a small subset of doctors take these advantage plans. And so if your doctor takes the original plan and you have an advantage plan and he says, I don't take advantage plan, tough luck. Either you're going to pay for that out of pocket or you're going to try to switch back to original Medicare at the next available time. Medicare supplement will be determined based on your health. Interesting. Yeah. This is so kind of coming back to the yep, basics. Bring it back. So here I am. I'm 64. I need to. And here's what you also have, right? You have a lot of people who their the spouses are not the same age. Correct. They're two to three years apart in either direction, right? Yes. So somebody's claiming. Mm -hmm. their Medicare Part B, and somebody's got two to three to four years to yeah. get there. I mean, yeah. so there's, and there are- Well, you brought up a very interesting point. You brought yeah. up very, so, so sometimes there's some benefits to this sort of two, three year gap where, you know, somebody gets the experience initially and then we learn from said experience so that when the second spouse comes along, we can, we can actually capitalize on what we wanted to do. But um, uh, more often, it's a question of, do I stay on my spouse's insurance? Do I continue um, through my retirement plan? Do I take Medicare? And in some cases where there's an age gap, but they both retired before 65, believe it or not, this is somewhat common too. Oh, know, very common. Folks were able to retire, let's say, late 50s, early 60s, and you know the final spouse retires at 62. All right, so now... You've got a 62-year-old and a 64-year-old. One's about to turn to Medicare, and he's pretty excited because he sees the cost, he understands the program, and he feels like he's going to be well covered with original Medicare and Plan G. What does the 63-year-old spouse do that now doesn't have access to employment coverage, is not yet ready for Medicare, yeah. and let's say that this couple makes one hundred twenty grand a year? Well, she's going to pay full price for individual insurance, which for a 63, 64-year-old may be $1,500 a month. Right. That's sort of what we've been that putting gap, in. That gap of two years created 
potentially a $20,000 annual expense for health insurance by not waiting to come off that employer coverage or wait to retire or wait until they were Medicare eligible. If this isn't carefully planned for, you could be spending outsized amounts of money in those final years before joining Medicare. And what's really interesting is, so I'm getting here, I'm 64, I start thinking about this. There's lots of, there's lots of almost like you got to think about it. It's like a decision matrix. Like it is like it is the unit of the family is, mm -hmm. you know, the dates of birth, whether they work for a small business mm -hmm. or they work for a large employer or they're self-employed. Mm -hmm. There's so many, you know, so, so many, many points. caveats. And then yeah. there's traps that if I don't make the right decisions, I can prevent myself from having really good foundational mm -hmm. coverage going Correct. forward. And then, as the plans have been changing, like we we started our conversation where we were talking about the landscape is changing, yes. and the government has this fabulous plan for us that you know it's health insurance Made for all, your whole life. Yeah. yeah, right. That's here for your entire life, but there's they're constantly trying to defray and push off the expenses to third parties, correct, and or tax more right. or well, Irma well, so Irma calculations. Less the responsibility of the federal system that is so generous, right? Correct. So if you join an advantage, well, their responsibility is limited to that stipend, right? If they take away a Medicare supplement that covered every out-of-pocket cost, which they did, it was the plan F, they, they took that off the market for new enrollees, well, now that's gone, you must shoulder the one uncovered item on the plan G, the $226 deductible. So what it comes down to you normally is that when there's a major change in Medicare, normally it's to transition some of the risk or out-of-pocket costs either onto a third party or onto you, the beneficiary. Interesting. Yeah. So how, like, from a recommendation standpoint, yeah. I hit this age point. Mm -hmm. What am I going, you know, what's my best course of action? Like, what do you, like, like what am I going to recommend? I call yeah. you, I call you. I want a consultation. Let's yes. just talk about how that thing works. For yeah. Sure. So first things first, you call me. We're going to have an initial just brief conversation about whether or not we even need to jump into this Medicare process at this time, right? Because if you are a retired teacher being offered incredible, fully paid retirement insurance for the rest of your life, this may be a quick conversation where I tell you to stick with it. But Medicare, but, Part A and B, yeah. home, yeah. and your and your health insurance covers you as your as your correct. B option. Correct. Correct. It's, yeah. Yes. There's um, a lot of that. Though. Yes. Now for any person who is actually, you know, needing to consider Medicare as an alternative or ready to join the program, what we will start with is the full Medicare 101. The education of the groundwork of how Medicare works, why it works that way, and how these other plan options, as we've discussed, fit into this larger system. That's what we start with. We start with the education. Right. Upon finishing that education, that's when the decisions are made, right? If we're going to go with a supplement, that's not where the decision ends. Sure, we may choose that I want a Medicare supplement, that was a great choice, but it goes further. Well, which company do I choose? Which exact Medicare supplement do I choose? How will this change if I change my residency state later in life? How much will this premium go up over my lifetime? Why does this premium go up in certain ways that other companies don't? There are a lot of things that go into choosing even just the carrier. Even that, like, I would think the carrier would be a decision from the standpoint of even where I'm going to, you know, I might summer mm -hmm. in New Jersey, I might winter in Colorado yes. for a little yes. bit. Yes, very common. And winter in Florida. Yeah. Those three locations. Well, that would lead you to stick with original Medicare so that you retain the nationwide network, no prior authorizations. But remember, a supplement isn't making decisions. No. If Medicare approves the claim, the supplement pays your responsibility. So it doesn't matter where you are, right. and no doctor can actually restrict any Medicare supplement if they take original Medicare. So said a different way, any physician that contracts with original Medicare has contracted to accept every standardized Medicare supplement in existence. Which is very valuable. Very valuable. How do, like, let's say that I'm you know, I've got a lot of medical conditions that okay. I'm actually taking and I'm taking medications. How important is really like the medic, you know, having a prescription plan? So having a prescription plan is important for a few reasons. Um, first of which, Medicare is going to find you if you don't take one when first available. All They're right? going to find you. They're going to find you. So 
we talked about the Part B penalty as 10% of the going monthly premium forever. The Part D penalty for prescription drugs, if you don't take this one first available, they will charge you 1% of the average annual premium for that year for every single month that you remained uncovered. So this is somewhat of a complicated calculation, but on average, if you go one year without drug coverage, you're tacking on $3.50 a month to your monthly drug plan premium when you do eventually take it, again, for the rest of your life. This money is collected directly from your Social Security check. So there is no, I'm not paying that fine. They take that money from you, and over a lifetime, it wasn't worth it. Because Medicare drug coverage can be had for as low as $6 a month. You can have a placeholder there, if you will, satisfying the requirement, but not necessarily paying for a, you know, a very robust plan because you may not take any medications. Now, what if yeah. you're on a ton of medications? Now, the drug plan is the most important part of your coverage. This is your biggest variable. Right. If you take a lot of medications, you probably deal with changing medications, right? right? And so this will become a moving target where initially we'll get a sense of what your current matrix of medications is going to cost you. But as your medications change, as the coverage changes, as the plans change, as the manufacturers and new drugs come out, your costs will change. Mm. Now, that's why I mentioned earlier how valuable that $2,500 out-of-pocket max that's coming along in 2025 will be because without it, it's unknown. Mm. How much will you pay for your drug? Well, that really depends. What would you get put on? I don't know. I can't tell you that. You can never estimate currently what your Medicare prescription drugs will cost because some medications are up to seven to ten thousand dollars a month. Right. No. Right? Oh, and if you happen to stance on a couple of those, which again is very unlikely, you could be out of money. You could be out a considerable amount of money. But again, always caveats. If you make less than a certain income amount, there's likely patient assistance for most of your drugs directly through the manufacturer. Right. Where as long as you know what you're doing, fill out a quick form with your doctor, and if you fall below their income levels, you may be able to get this medication for free. Right. All right. If so your income levels are in there. If they're below it. Now, during COVID, I'm not going to lie, these income levels really were uh, hot. Um, there were some medications that were, you know, provided for free with income levels up to $150,000, $160,000. That seems to have been reined in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Most of the income levels are between now, like between $55,000 and $105,000. Right. Uh, but it's something to consider because if you can work your income in a way to show an adjusted gross income below these levels, you may be able to avoid paying seven thousand dollars a month for a drug like Humira. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, so so this is so the this the medication mm -hmm. decision is either the biggest part or means nothing at all because you don't take any prescription drugs in the moment. In the moment, with an ever-changing landscape of its own. Now, I told you in 2006, or sorry, 2003, is when Medicare brought in Medicare Advantage. Right. It wasn't until 2006 that they brought in prescription drug coverage. Mm -hmm. So this was late to the game. Mm -hmm. It is not as well-funded as parts A and B of Medicare. It's a completely separate system. Yeah. With its own deductibles, its own co-pays, its own smattering of plans. And so this decision on the drug plan is extremely ordinarily important if you are on a number of medications. It's always an important decision, right. but that number of medications is where you need an expert, an expert, because different drugs cost different amounts on different plans at different pharmacies. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, the plan that's best for you, a 64-year-old on a number of medications that are of high cost, is the plan that results in you spending the least money for the year for those medications. Mm -hmm. And there's no other way to look at it, but People don't do it that way. As simple as that sounds. What plan is going to cost me the least for my medications? That's all there is to it, but that's not how people set up their drug plans. No. They make a phone call to one insurance carrier that they've you know, thought of as one of the premier Medicare providers, and they call this insurance carrier. I'm not going to name names, but they say, give me your best plan. And the insurance carrier says, great, you must meet our most expensive drug plan. All of a sudden, this beneficiary is in a $120 a month Medicare drug plan where they don't take any medications, and they're spending twelve, fourteen hundred dollars a year on a plan they're not using. When little did they know they could have been spending six dollars a month and could change that every single year as their regimen changed. Okay, that is where we see clients overspend the most. That right there, between a couple, right, 
is roughly $2,500 for the year of overspending. That idea of paying up for a plan that you don't need over the course of 20, 25 years, that's another $100,000. Right. And this is where the really having somebody to talk to. You to, need somebody to talk to. To do this and to, if you've made the proper decisions at the proper times, then you have flexibility moving Correct. forward. Correct. There if you, you go. don't have... But what you should be really doing is reevaluating. Yes. Like, what would be a perfect way to review your well, Medicare and Medicare supplement? How frequently should somebody do that? So, if your if your health ailments or you know the um, you know the amount of services you are using or medications you are taking is changing, we need to be looking at this every year, right. specifically the medication plan, right? Because they give you one time a year to take a look at it. And if you happen to not make a choice and you went on a number of medications and they're not covered by your plan, you're out of luck next year if you didn't change. You're paying for those out of pocket. So the onus is on you, the beneficiary, to determine whether you need to change your drug plan. So we as brokers try to help with that process, right? People know when they go on new medications or something looks like it's changing and they'll call us and they'll ask for a review. But as brokers, let me be honest, these Medicare prescription plans compensate us next to nothing. Right. This is the biggest decision for folks that are on major medications. It's the most amount of work for us. And in often cases, we don't even get compensated for it. Some of the largest prescription drug plan carriers last year took away commissions on plans that they've always commissioned. So, you, so in, in general, yeah. we would love to help every single person reevaluate their drug plan every year, but that is just not feasible. Because yeah. there's no money to do so. And unfortunately, we can't work like dogs for free and run a business. We will always be there to answer the question, set it up, provide the training on how to do it. And we spend the money on the software to help automate these processes. But there is a limit to what one person can do year in and year out on your drug plan. Right. Um, the best way and sort of the perfect picture is for an initial setup and understanding from somebody like me. Maybe the first couple of years we have a conversation in the fall during the open enrollment. I explain to you either why we should or shouldn't switch. And over that time period, I've trained you. I've educated you on what you need to be looking for. The, you know, the Medicare.gov search portal to search your own medication. See what's changing so that you can come to me armed with the knowledge that you need to change rather than me telling you what you need to do. Right. And that... There's so many resources that you have on your So website. many resources we have on the website. I mean, we've got a 30-minute training video that goes through all the odds and ends of OriginalMedicare.gov's search portal for their prescription drug plans. And Will's website is New Jersey Life and Health, spelt out the and, spelt Except out. NJ, so instead of New Jersey, oh. NJ Life and NJ Health. NJ Life and Health .com. There's so many resources on there. His yes. phone number is on there. But like, what is your phone number to call to get uh, an appointment? 848-226-6897 is our office number. Okay. Okay. Talk to somebody there. They can help you. Correct. There's always somebody there that can help. Yes. You know, if everybody happens to be busy at that exact moment you call, you'll get a call back very, very shortly. But we currently have about eight in-house agents um, and three or four out-of-house agents. And as I mentioned earlier, we're a family business. Right. So when you call in, you may find me, you may find my brother, my father, my uncle, our friends from home, etc. We do keep this business close because the way we operate is with a sound moral compass. You have to do the right thing. And what we found is it's really family and friends that you can bring into a fold like that and entrust, you know, those sorts of, you know, I ideologies yeah. to make sure that they are doing the right thing Absolutely. every single time. Absolutely. Yeah. This was this was really insightful. It, it it shed a lot of really good light on a, on topics that people don't really want to talk about. Of course. And I think, you know, one of the things that we're always focusing on is, you know, having that cash flow in the cash flow. Like we create a, a separate cash flow line in the financial planning that's yeah. doing it. I think we might need to raise our numbers for the client. 
Uh, now, I mean, and, and again, you know, these numbers I gave you, I made the assumption of 3% inflation. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, Which is what we do. Yeah, you have a few things moving against us, such as healthcare inflation, a few things working with us, like the out-of-pocket max coming to Part D. And so I think the numbers I gave you are a pretty good proxy for what people can expect. But for our next conversation, like we mentioned earlier, this doesn't include long-term care, private duty nursing, the cost of family members helping in your later life. Um, I mean, think about think about and and, and most guys... importantly, this doesn't include the prescription drugs. I made an assumption of twenty dollars a month increase at three percent inflation a year. So that's it's just not the total that everyone else may see, depending on what their specific circumstance is. And these numbers are New Jersey numbers. Right. And my book, It's Your Wealth, Keep It, <laughs> right? My book, it's, it's Your Wealth, Keep It, those, like, we talk about transfer yeah. of wealth, mm -hmm. right? And proper planning helps protect against that. But even you start thinking about the amount of money that, it's going out the door for husband and wife just with the baseline coverage, having yes. good coverage. And then you yes. factor in shit happens yes. or bad stuff happens, yes. right? And now you have long-term care costs and you have inflation that's not 3%. It's actually higher. Yeah. And you have like, there's yeah. so many moving variables here, right? So my position always is, is that this is important. It's a really important decision to make. It's, part of the getting ready for a retirement plan we put it in every conversation yes but the further you're away from that the less important is because sure. all these variables are constantly changing but the reality is things are probably going to cost more than you expect them yes to cost they're going to take longer to complete than they than you think they are and there's going to be more constant changes that force you to stay up to speed. Stay city. on your game. And that is even tougher when you make it into those older years where things are changing in front of you and you still need to be up to speed or at the very least have a trusted person, yeah, right? Yeah. A trusted um, resource who can tell you, hey, that bozo calling you on the phone is actually not from where they said they were calling from. And please make sure you don't give out your Medicare number on the phone. Like I mentioned earlier, we get dozens and dozens of calls a year from people in their 80s who say, something happened. I don't know what happened, but I got a new card in the mail. I can't use my Medicare doctors. They got duped over the phone and they were none the wiser because... And there's no protection for that. There's not. Well, there are loopholes. There are loopholes. And, um, and they're not necessarily loopholes as much as ways to help yourself out of a, of a bad situation. So for example, in that case... If it's been less than a year, you could call Original Medicare and file what's known as a marketing misrepresentation. You didn't know you were joining a new plan. And if that's really the case, then the person who sold it to you has it's, done wrong. Has they, done wrong. And they need to be reported. Yeah. Now, hopefully you still have their name and the number they call from. But if you have nothing, well, now you may be in a pickle because there's nobody to fall back on. Um, but Medicare will help with a marketing misrepresentation if you were truly put into the wrong plan unbeknownst to you but you know what that idea of filing marketing misrepresentation nobody knows that no. nobody knows that and, you know no. they basically assume this is the plan i have and then you know they call the carrier let's say it's one of the carriers you know you think that carrier is going to let them know about a marketing misrepresentation where their associate may be linked to it no. absolutely not no. they're going to say here are your other options for another medicare advantage plan here are some of your alternatives for next year rather than actually helping you file what needs to be filed and get back to the plan you thought you had. Right. Yeah. So again, knowing what you own, knowing, knowing, what you got. knowing why you have it, mm -hmm. is it doing what I needed to do now? And do I actually have the flexibility to modify it moving forward? Because yes. I don't, you know, I'm a big fan of having maximum protection. Right. Maximum protection and flexibility, like you mentioned. Now, the flexibility on changing your Medicare supplement, that one piece of this matrix, that is where the flexibility goes away upon dealing with health issues. Yeah. Now, you can change your drug plan. You yeah. can switch over to Advantage, but you cannot move around within that Medicare supplement world if you have pre-existing conditions. Correct. So yeah. it's really important to pick really good quality the first time. The first you time. You have to pick the right plan the first time. You have to make good decisions yeah. today. Today. In you what you're doing. You have to go into it 
fully educated on why you are making that decision. Yeah. I can't I, I can't tell you how many times people will come in and you know they'll tell me what they want, right? I want a plan G, I want a drug plan because Joe down the street has it, he used you and he says it's great. I'm not just gonna do that for you. Right. I'm going to make you sit through this education because that type of person is the type of person who a year later is gonna pick up the phone from some random guy who says, do you get your vision benefit? They're gonna say no, but yeah. before they know it, they're in the wrong plan because they haven't been educated how this system works. So it's really a protection piece. It's protection. Really protection is the right word here because you wanna protect your access to these services. You wanna protect your predictable future costs. These are all things that you need to be cognizant of before you make this decision. This is really good. This is a good place to put an end to this conversation for, for the moment. But what I want to say is anybody listening to the podcast, you have friends, you have family members, you have people that can benefit from this conversation. I ask you to share that with as many people as you possibly can. Put comments, put questions to us, go on the social media sites, give us questions the more information that we can provide to help you make the best decisions today for your plan or leading up to make these decisions is the most important part of a wealth plan, right? right. And you know what we were talking about before, maximum protection, maximum flexibility, but we also want to achieve this with the least amount of cost because right. the transfers of wealth are massive. Yes, And our job yes. is to help you figure out where those transfers of wealth are and minimizing those, those experiences in your plan. But I, getting started in a plan, having a plan is the most important part of what you can do. And if you have the right strategies, you can reduce the impact of all of these things in the transfers of wealth in your retirement plan. Yes. I look forward to talking to you. Call us, email us. Uh, snail mail us, whatever the way you want to communicate with us. We're here to help you. Our team, our team is here to help you to build the plan. We refer this out to experts when we need this because we know what we know, but we know what we don't know, yes. which we don't want to know. No, no, I'm just, just yeah. kidding. But, <laughs> but it's like, this is a nuance that unfortunately ripples through the entire financial plan if it's done wrong. Correct, correct. And, and I just want to leave everyone with, you want to have a trusted insurance specialist on your side when it comes to health and Medicare. Yeah. Right? You need someone you can rely on, someone you can ask those questions. Uh, why did I get this bill in the mail? Why am I having trouble with this? Someone who knows how to navigate the system who will be here for you forever. Yeah. That is what everyone needs. And I want to be clear, Brokers such as myself and my business, we do not work for any insurance company. Right. We work for you, the clients. We are compensated by the insurance carriers, don't get me wrong, but you, the client, does not pay us, and nor do you pay more to use us. You get the exact same plan at the exact same rate, except you have us in your corner working for you. And it sounds like you might actually pay less if you get the right coverage. Well, that's true versus, as well. Versus you choose the coverage. right company and right plan, you're actually paying less over time. And these companies pay us to avoid you having to call in and ask, what plan do I have? I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Fabulous. Thank you. It's your wealth. Keep it. The best-selling book by John L. Smallwood. The definitive guide to growing, protecting, enjoying, and passing on your wealth. Find it on Amazon now or go to smallwoodwealth.com for more retirement resources. Wealth Curve Talk with John L. Smallwood is brought to you by Smallwood Wealth Management, an investment advisor representative. Strategies mentioned may not be suitable for everyone, and the information expressed does not take into account your specific situation or objectives and is not intended as recommendations appropriate for you. Information has been obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. Always consult with a qualified investment, legal, or tax professional before taking any action as information and or opinions 
are subject to change without notice. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Past performance cannot be used as an indicator to determine future results. Smallwood Wealth Management provides content that is true and accurate as of the date of publishing. However, we give no assurance or warranty regarding the accuracy, timeliness, or applicability of any of the contents. We assume no responsibility for information contained on this website or podcast and disclaim all liability in respect of such information, including, but not limited to, any liability for errors, inaccuracies, omissions, misleading, or defamatory statements.